up. Thank you so much, Penny. Can people hear me? Can you hear me all the way? Oh, okay, I got a thumbs up from the back. Well, you know, go like this if you can't hear, and I'll yell even louder. But anyway, thank you so much. It's great to be here. I haven't spoken in this library before, and uh, so it's fun to see it. Thank you, Penny. Um, I want to start out by saying that, you know, the popular TV show, The Big Bang Theory, anybody watch yeah. The Big Bang Theory? begins with a theme song that runs through all of history from the Big Bang to the present in less than 60 seconds. And, uh, you know, some of you may have heard of, like, 60-second Shakespeare, where they can do, you know, any Shakespeare play in a minute, you know. Well, this talk is going to be kind of like that. Uh, it's going to be one of those experiments. So hang on to your chairs as we whip through nearly 14 billion years of history that have gone into creating the Lake Champlain we know and love. It all started with the Big Bang. So let's start off with geological eons. I'm going to read you a sidebar from my book, Hands on the Land, that quickly summarizes geological time as it happened in this place. It's called Half a Dozen Summers at Your Camp on Lake Champlain. I mean, half a billion summers on your camp on Lake Champlain. So pretend for a minute that you were able to get a good deal on a place on Lake Champlain during the Cambrian period <laughs> 500 million years ago. You should have your pick of spots. There won't be any other human beings here for another 499 million years. Uh, the weather is lovely and tropical, but the beach is barren because all of the plants still live in the water. Little shelled sea creatures cling to the limestone rocks, and in only a couple of million years, the fishing will start to get good. <laughs> so between 500 billion years ago and today, the mountains will rise up from the shore and be almost entirely eroded three times. You will be blessedly free of mosquitoes and cockroaches, but only for the first 100 million years. Uh, the land will turn green with plants, and animal life will diversify steadily. Nearly half of all the plant and animal species around you will be wiped out at least three times, probably due to clouds of thick dust created by huge meteors hitting the earth. The dust is so thick that it keeps light and most heat away from all life forms until it settles in a year or two each time. Not good summers for you either. Your tropical paradise gets steadily colder as the tectonic plate on which you ride drifts to the north. Four ice ages occur, with glaciers up to two miles thick covering the site of your camp. And when the glaciers start to melt, your camp is flooded as the waters extend nearly to the base of the Green Mountains. And as the last glacier recedes, seawater rushes in from the north, and you find yourself living on an arm of the Atlantic Ocean. The present law occurs between ice ages. Catch some sun before the glaciers come back, and keep up payments on your homeowner's insurance. So obviously this is a fantasy, but you get the picture. Lake Champlain and the Champlain Lowlands to, were to become the cradle of civilization for a geographical area that is now 100 miles long and up to 20 miles wide, edged by the Green Mountains on the east and the Adirondacks on the west. It is, like the, it is likely that the majority of all the people who have ever lived in the place we now call Vermont lived in this valley. 500 billion years ago, million years ago, the ancestral green mountains lay at the edge of a continental plate with a warm ocean lapping on the western shore. New life forms were appearing in this era and made their homes in Vermont's waters. Little sea creatures, brachiopods, mollusks, trilobites, burrowed in the sand, floated on the currents, and searched for food. The fossilized remains of these centuries-old creatures are common in the Champlain Valley, especially on the shoreline rocks at the DAR State Park in Addison 
and had scattered spots in the Champlain Islands. You can see the little forms of the mollusks in the rock. Near the end of the last ice age, only 20,000 years ago, the glacial ice cover was over one mile deep, completely obliterating the highest peaks in the Green Mountains. An ice pack of these dimensions has an enormous amount of water in it. And when it finally began to melt, the water had to go somewhere. A large glacial lake formed on the site of the present Lake Champlain, and it went through three distinct stages. First, the body of water to known today as Lake Vermont began to grow when melting water was blocked to the north by the retreating glacier. The lake initially drained to the south then, near present-day Coveville, New York, emptying into the Hudson. So it's all going to the south. This is known as the Coveville stage of Lake Vermont. It was a huge lake extending eastward and completely swamping the future sites of Burlington, St. Albans, Bristol, Middlebury. Its water level was 620 feet in the future Burlington um, and 400 feet in Brandon. Snake Mountain and Addison and Mount Philo right here in Shalott were tall enough to rise as islands. They were just little islands rising above this sea. In Burlington, only the top of the hill on which the University of Vermont now sits was above the waterline. The lake eventually found a large new outlet to the south near Fort Ann, New York, lowering the lake level during its middle stage. The North American glaciers were really heavy. I mean, if you can imagine the weight of that much ice, solid ice as much as two miles thick in some places. They were so weighty that they depressed the land below sea level. As the final glacier melted back into Canada around 10,000 BC, the level of the land was low enough that the Atlantic Ocean backed up the St. Lawrence Seaway into Lake Vermont. Lake Vermont slowly filled with salt water becoming the Champlain Sea. And for 2,000 years, until about 8200 BC, marine creatures burrowed into its banks, porpoises and seals sunned on its rocks, and whales spouted in Burlington Bay. We know this because they found the bones of whales, which is really pretty amazing to think of. Um, Perhaps the most amazing thing about this saltwater period is that by the end of it, there were people here to see the spouting whales. People saw whales spout in Vermont. The Champlain Valley is one of the warmest parts of the state with the least snow and the richest soil and, and the longest growing season. So the Paleo-Indians who arrived in Vermont decided to stay, uh, at least some of them stayed here. And at the end of the Ice Age, they found this kind of patchy, tundra-like environment with scrubby plants and outcroppings of small spruce that looked a lot like the Arctic tundra does today. So we've gone from the tropical way back in the eons to the cold glaciers to this kind of in-between like today, maybe. Uh, kind of dreary, dreary place. Um, so the Paleo Indians lived here in this damp, dark, uh, chewy, post glacial landscape for about 2,000 years, from 9,000 BC to 7,000 BC. And the moving ice had scraped the land here, but the seeds of tough grasses and mosses and lichens were starting to sprout. The ground was all kind of wet and springy with ponds and puddles of glacial meltwater everywhere. And as the land started to dry out, uh, the mosses were followed by sparse woodlands of hardy fir and spruce, scraggly and kind of wildly spaced, kind of like copses here and there. And on the large, grassy, sub saharan plains, of North America, including the part that would become Vermont, herds of wild, large animals started to roam. Bison and caribou 
Woolly mammoths, musk oxen, and mastodons populated the returning forests. And they proved, you know, the perfect prey for the hunting Paleo Indians. The largest mammoths had shoulders as high as a tall ceilinged living room. There were bear and deer and a giant beaver that grew to six feet long. <laughs> it's kind of scary. I don't want to see it. They're doing enough damage in my backyard. Uh, smaller animals also were making their way into the region. Shrews and snowshoe rabbits and mice and ptarmigan and grouse. The seals barked and the whales sang in the chilly salt water of the Champlain Sea. And the Paleo Indians hunted on its banks. The Great Lake and the rivers that flowed into it provided food and water and relatively easy transportation for the first people. The span of native history running from first con you know, running up until the first contact with Europeans is generally divided into three periods. The Paleo Indian from 9000 to 7000 BC, Archaic from 7000 BC to 900 BC, and the Woodland from 900 BC to 1600 AD. The Archaic Era saw the development of hunting and gathering societies adapted to the new hardwood forests, which were slowly coming back in the area. The woodland is defined by the introduction of pottery and agriculture and increased trade and mortuary ceremonialism. They buried their dead in special ways. And for thousands of years, native people uh, used and settled their favorite lands in Vermont on the bluffs over Otter Creek and the Missisqua and the Lamoille and the Winooski from the Northeast Kingdom to the Taconics, but they loved the shores of Lake Champlain and spent many of the warm months there going up to hunt in their deer camps. They had their own deer camping areas in the Green Mountains in the fall. So on the cusp of European contact in 1600, most of the largest Western Abenaki villages were clustered on or near the lake at Masisqua, which is Swanton, and, mouth, and the mouths of the Otter Creek, and the Winooski, and the Lamoille Rivers, where they came into the lake. Their neighbors on the west side of the lake, the New York side now, spoke a language that was no more similar to theirs than Chinese is to English. So the Mohawk are on the west side of the lake, and they are completely unable to speak to the Abenaki, which is an Algonquian tribe on the east side of the lake. So since about 2000 BC, Iroquois and Mohawks and Algonquian speaking Abenaki faced each other across the lake with great suspicion, as they would still uh, 3,600 years later when Samuel de Champlain arrived to put his French name on their watery border. So the Abenaki believed that almost all of the objects in the world were animate. Everything, not, it didn't have to move to be animate. To them, a rock was animate. A twig was animate even after it had fallen from the bough. Um, and they thought that everything had a life force. Everything with physical uh, presence had a life force. And in their scheme, the role of the creator was taken by Gluskabe, who made all of the living things. And in this system, Gluskabe was the only owner. There are no owners among the Abnaki. There is only the creator. He, the creator owns everything. So uh, Gluskabe had a helper, Odziodzo who was able to create himself from some dust that had been touched by Gluskabe. And Odziodzo is often thought of as the transformer because he had the power to alter the shape of the land that would become Vermont. He personified all the unknown forces of plate tectonics, botany, and biology, heaping dirt to make the mountains, carving the rivers, 
planting the trees and altering the animals so that they could be more easily hunted by people. And his last and greatest creation in Abnaki mythology was Lake Champlain, which he loved so much that he decided to stay there and admire it for eternity. The Abnaki believed that Rock Dunder, which is out in Burlington Bay, it's a big rock. You see it. I just saw it flying in from D.C. yesterday. You see it out there. They believed that was really Odziozo enjoying the beauty of his handiwork. So the environment places limits on the possibility for life in this or any place. For the foreseeable future, winters will be cold, summers warm, the Green Mountains round, Lake Champlain dark blue under a summer sky, the soil, the terrain, the water resources, all led the Abnaki to have higher populations in the valleys as we do today. They headed to the mountains for hunting and to the lake for recreation as people do today. Native people understood how to manage their hunting responsibly and we try to do the same. The Abnaki didn't build any large cities in Vermont, but we haven't either. <laughs> okay, we think this is pretty big in Burlington, but no. So, uh, so that was the first, uh, you know, we had the geological period and then the first people period, but now we're coming to a new, a new era. In 1600, Vermont was a relatively calm place where native people had left their marks on the landscape, paths in the woods, clearings for agriculture. They were farming on the shores of the lake. The bones of their dead deer could be found in the woods. But nine years later, in 1609, the brilliant French adventurer Samuel de Champlain was making his way up the body of water that he felt he had a right to name for himself because he had taken a lot of trouble to get there, right? So uh, on a July morning in 1609, he managed to embroil himself in a dangerous run-in with about 200 native Mohawk on the western shore, right near what's now the site of Fort Ticonderoga. Here is Champlain's account of that incident. I marched on until I was within some 30 yards of the enemy, who as soon as they caught sight of me halted and gazed at me and I at them. When I saw them make a move to draw their bows upon us, I took aim with my arquebus and shot straight at one of the three chiefs. And with this shot, two fell to the ground and one of their companions was wounded, who died thereof a little later. The Iroquois were much astonished that two men should have been killed so quickly. Although they were provided with shields made of cotton thread woven together and wood, which was proof against their arrows. This frightened them greatly. Seeing their chiefs dead, they lost courage and took to flight, abandoning the field and their fort and fleeing into the depths of the forest whither I pursued them and laid low still more of them. The place where this attack took place is 43 degrees and some minutes of latitude and was named Lake Champlain. So Champlain was the first white man, man to venture into the great wooded valley that ran south from the St. Lawrence into the mountains. He was hoping that he was going to be able to mitigate the Iroquois, mostly Mohawk, threat in the St. Lawrence Valley to further secure the Gallic right to claim New France. His companions were Algonquin-speaking natives of different Canadian tribes, Hurons, Algonquins, Montanais, that he brought with him from the little French village of Quebec. He could barely communicate with them himself, um, but they shared the common goal of wanting to push the Mohawk further from the French and Algonquian-controlled regions to the north and the east. So on this fateful day, warriors and woven tunics were no match for the European killing machine. Seeing their chiefs, chiefs so sadly slaughtered, most of the enemy warriors ran into the forest in terror 
The victors crossed the lake to the mouth of Otter Creek, where Champlain danced and sang with his native comrades in celebration of the victory. Indian and Frenchmen alike knew that fighting was, in some way, about who would possess the land. Yet on that summer night, on the shores of the great water, Champlain's Algonquian allies had no more understanding of Western conceptions of private property than the, Mo had, than the Mohawk had of arquebuses. Champlain formally claimed the land and the lake for France. And later he wrote, I had no intention other than to make war. Champlain's battle with the Mohawk was the first shot in a century and a half of bloodshed over the part of North America that would become Vermont. And Lake Champlain itself was Europe's great battlefield in the New World. Historians have long debated whether Champlain was the great explorer or the great exploiter. The reality was more complicated than either version of such a story would suggest. So the first Battle of Lake Champlain was a minor skirmish in the history of warfare, but it foreshadowed the long initial phase of the European occupation of North America. For the next century and a half, the lake and its valley formed a rugged no man's land between the more comfortable settlements of New England and New France. The Indians, the French, and the English would all fight to lay claim to this long track of the north woods and water. And for each of these three groups, the landscape held a very different meaning. For, for before the European settlers could turn their hands to the land, they had to get their hands on the land. And so the period from 1689 to 1760 saw an almost continual state of war as the French and their allies, including the Abenaki and the British with the Iroquois, Mohawk played out their conflicts over who was to control the seemingly boundless resources of the northern forest until the la final large battles. These were mostly wars of small-scale raids and counter-raids and guerrilla warfare in the woods, with Lake Champlain providing quick transportation by boat and canoe. Decade after decade, settlements were ambushed, their inhabitants were scalped or forced marched to New France as prisoners. This is a significant topic for the study of the landscape because the winner was really going to determine how this land was going to look and who was going to use it. From 1609 until statehood came to Vermont in 1791, people of European ancestry, ancestry struggled to, to claim the land that would become Vermont in a free-for-all that would long delay the creation of settled communities. I mean, it's interesting when you think that you know there were the 13 original colonies that made the original states. Vermont is the 14th state, but it's like, you know, a century and a half later than you know the first ones, and that's because of this fight, because of their geographical position between New England and New France. Lake Champlain took on enormous strategic importance at a time when water provided the quickest and easiest mode of transportation. Forts soon sprang up on the banks of the lake as the great powers struggled to claim their territories. The Europeans understood that part of claiming ground was clearing it of all your enemies. The Indians who helped the Europeans in the wars would not see the implications of this for themselves until it was too late. On July 26, 1666, a diverse group of 60 French soldiers, fur traders, and Jesuit missionaries assembled to dedicate a fort to St. Anne on the northern tip of Isle Lamotte in Lake Champlain. 
It was the first real European settlement in Vermont, constructed as a launching pad against the obstreperous Mohawk. Forts could hold the land temporarily, but only settlers could retain it. And this became the issue. You know, if you're going to have a fort, people have to stay there and fight off all comers. In 1731, the French built a stockade called the Fort at Pointe de la Chevelure on the Vermont side, near where the Champlain Bridge goes across. Um, and then they, vote, then they built the large Fort St. Frederick on the Crown Point side. So where Crown Point is was a huge French fort and then a smaller fort on the Vermont side. Um, and that was set up to guard the Mid Lake and the way, you know, to stop anyone moving up or down from Lake George and coming from, you know, New England in the south and the south. Um, back in France, Louis XV hatched a plan to introduce a seigneurial system of large land grants along the floor of Lake Champlain, where the French elite could lure peasant laborers to build great estates. He thought, we have to nail this down, we'll make it look like France. Um, and so he created, they laid out 16 of these seigneuries, which were wide strips going back from the shore, back, you know, like the strip farms when you cross into Quebec, it immediately has long strips. Well, that's the idea behind this, but these were wide, and there were only 16 of them going out on the east side where the good farmland was on the east side of the lake. Um, and uh, he thought this, this is going to be what nails down New France as we move south. And, uh, but why should the elite leave the comforts of Paris? I mean, why do they want to leave France? And why should peasants cross an ocean to remain peasants? Um, there was a problem with this plan. So only two small French communities resulted. The Seigneury of Foucault in Alberg and a little French settlement at Chimney Point where the Champlain Bridge is today, where what I was talking about. And most of its residents were retired soldiers from the nearby fort who were given land there by the king to settle with their families. So here, land on the lake shore was cleared for like three or four miles going up from, you know, from where the bridge is today. Um, and the settlers living there were in these rough, mean, wooden houses with stone chimneys. By 1740, there were probably about a thousand permanent residents of, from France living on the shores of Lake Champlain. Pretty much of a dismal failure compared to the grandiose ideas of the king back home. So with the failure of French settlement, the French and the, their Indian allies were only able to predominate for most of the French and Indian War period because they adapted to work in the wilderness better than the English did. The French were great voyageurs. I mean, they were great trappers and, you know, and uh, canoe builders and, and uh, and they got the whole wilderness thing very quickly. Um, um, but, uh, you know, the English were better settlers. The English were good at laying down and clearing the fields and starting to, to you know, they were, had done a great job settling New England, you know, southern New England. And they were, you know, they wanted to get up here and do the same. Realizing that they couldn't, compete with the French and the native people's facility for forest fighting, the English fell back on their own military traditions, mustering pure firepower. In 1759, the English army under Sir Geoffrey Amherst captured the French superfort of Carillon that the French had just completed, now Fort Ticonderoga and built a new, huge new fort at Crown Point. 
The final defeat of the French came on the Plains of Abraham at Quebec City in September of 1759. The French and Indian Wars were over. However, Lake Champlain's days as a battlefield weren't at an end. Uh, settlers started to flow into the region, only to find uh, there were first fights over whether the land they wanted to settle belonged to New York or New Hampshire. And then, you know, but that was more of a legal battle. And uh, though there were some skirmishes there too, uh, people, those Yorkers could be tough. Um, but, uh, but then, just as a few people were starting to really lay down some roots, um, they found their efforts disrupted by the American Revolution. The lake was back to being a military route with beefed up forts on her banks and great armies plying her waters. By 1775, the war had come to the Champlain Valley. Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys took Ticonderoga for the Americans that May and fort building was revived with the raising of Mount Independence. In 1777, when the British general, John Burgoyne, retook Ticonderoga, the valley was terrorized. In the words of Middlebury's early historian Samuel Swift, there were foraging parties of British, Indians, and Tories who plundered and carried off all such movable property as was left behind and desired by them. By then, most of the settlers in western Vermont had retreated south, often to the Massachusetts and Connecticut towns from which they had come to wait out the war in greater safety. The following year, the British came back up the lake and went through the Otter Creek Valley determined to clear the Champlain Valley of all settlers. After British Major Christopher Carleton's reign of terror, the focus of the revolution moved back south. Finally, as the war wound down in the 1780s, refugees who had gone south could safely pour back into the Champlain Valley. And now they were, born, they were joined by thousands and thousands and thousands more. So we get to a new era. And that is the era of the industrial Lake Champlain. While Lake Champlain retained its, trans, its importance as a transportation hub, its primary focus shifted to industry. Over 150,000 people flocked to Vermont from the end of the Revolutionary War to 1800, with many of them choosing stakes in the fertile soils of the Champlain Valley. They first turned their hands to felling the great virgin forest to clear fields for farming. Vermont's first major non-agricultural product was logging. And uh, as the trees came tumbling down, people started to realize there might be a market for the forest in the growing towns of the St. Lawrence Valley. Why were they looking to the St. Lawrence Valley? Because the water flows north. Uh, they didn't yet have a way to get a log down to New York City, so they're looking north. A Colchester man named Stephen Mallet of Mallet's Bay rumored to be a retired pilot, pirate, a retired pirate, spent a year assembling the first shipment of oak and shipped it north on the lake to Quebec in 1794, where it proved to be a great success. So before the railroads, almost all of the logs had to be moved by water in large rafts that were collected over the winter months. The Lake Champlain number, lumber rafts were floated north until 1823, when the Champlain Canal, joining the southern tip of the lake and the Hudson River, uh, spun shipping in a 180-degree turn to the south. These lumber rafts were huge. They would just like get all the lumber together, and guys would be out running around on the logs, poking them around. And, uh, and they, they even had tents and log cabins sitting on the top to provide homes for the crew 
on the way to market. But Jeffrey, Thomas Jefferson's embargo of 1807 against Canada slowed the Canadian trade until it was realizing, realized that smuggling to the north was pretty safe and very lucrative. So it has been estimated that the white pine and oak logs that went over the Canadian border in 1810 alone were worth $600,000. And that at the height of the embargo. And that, you know, is a phenomenal sum in today's money. The lumber trade of Western Vermont helped to make Burlington the third largest lumber port in the nation by the end of this period. Its success was such that marketable trees had been virtually eliminated from the Champlain Valley by 1840. And now the people who had settled here were forced to buy wood for themselves. So the first quarter of the 19th century saw Vermont agriculture and industry booming. Lake Champlain and its tributaries were home to sawmills, gristmills, farms, textile operations, blacksmiths, and factories making everything from nails to guns. And they all needed to get their products to market. As the Champlain Valley turned into one of the richest agricultural and industrial regions of Vermont, the lake was receiving ever more commercial use. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, now they could go either to the north or to the south. So, I mean, it's kind of amazing just to think of what it would have looked like to be on the lake and everywhere you would have seen boats. You know, there would have been all manner of steamships and boats and canoes and, and little, you know, trade vessels of all kinds of sort. Everything hauling, hauling, hauling. I mean, all that stuff that's on a... A train or a truck now was on the lake. And uh, it was a very, very busy place. And one of the great industries of the period was marble. Black marble was found on the shores of Lake Champlain in Shoreham. And, uh, and it graced the mantles of Montreal until the Champlain Canal of 1823 started sending that marble south to New York and Philadelphia. Dark green serpentine was found up in the Green Mountains and shipped down over the lake. I mean, stone is heavy. Or water, water shipping is the best. Um, but the most beautiful and valuable stone was the marble of western Vermont. Um, from, you know, Middlebury to down by, you know, Proctor and beyond. And this, uh, you know, cool, milky, white marble with its pale gray veins was some of the most beautiful marble the world has ever produced. And, uh, and it was soon going down the waters of the lake to be shipped all over the East Coast and even further. On a June day in 1809, Captain John Winans, a devout Quaker and former assistant to steamship inventor Robert Fulton, stood on the deck of the steamship he has built as it puffed its way out of Burlington Bay for the first time. His little daughter Joanna was at his side amid the noise and the smoke, cradling her very frightened kitten. With this Trip, his dream of building the world's first commercial steamship fleet on Lake Champlain became a reality. The premier vessel, a ship of Quaker-like starkness, dubbed the Vermont, began running on a set route from Whitehall in the south to Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu in the north, which was a 24-hour voyage. The unfamiliar boiler induced terror in some of the passengers. One old lady was recorded as having spent hours badgering a fellow travel on whether we would die by hot water on deck or cold water below. <laughs> Fun trip. Uh, steamships would soon become more elegant and comfortable, ruling the lake until the coming of the railroads made them seem slow and cumbersome. 
the long anticipated southern shipping route, which appeared with the opening of the Champlain Canal, stretched for 64 miles, 45 and a half of them artificial canal, between Waterford, New York on the Hudson and Whitehall. The canal meant that Vermont goods could now go to the more numerous markets to the south as easily as they went to the north. And the cost of shipping from Burlington to Albany went down 80% almost overnight. So Vermont's trade was turning more and more toward the more larger and more lucrative southern markets. But the Champlain Canal was to prove to be another broken promise for the Vermonters. Access to markets meant access to competition, and Vermont firms were not distinguished by their efficiency in comparison to far-flung competitors. While the canal was the making of Burlington with its perfect harbor, smaller ports like Vergennes were quickly being cut out of the picture. Water may not flow both ways, but water traffic can. And the conduit that seemed to hold so much promise of bringing Vermont goods to distant markets was soon flooding Vermont with lower priced goods from other places. Many of Vermont's industries could not compete. Then there were the railroads. Now railroads came to Vermont relatively late. So the, you know, the whole bo boat traffic you know, held up here a little longer. Um, in 1848, Vermont saw its first train fully 17 years after trains had started to run on the pioneering Albany and Schenectady line. The Canadians had managed to link Montreal with Lake Champlain navigation as Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu you know, a town halfway between the Vermont border and Montreal by 1836. But by the time the railroads made it over the Green Mountains, little Vermont was left standing on the platform, waving as the train of prosperity headed west. And a lot of Vermonters jumped on for the ride. So the industrial era of Lake Champlain was drawing to a close. Most great cities are found on large bodies of water, but Lake Champlain was never mighty enough to support mass urbanization. Burlington was and remains Vermont's big city, despite its relatively small scale. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Burlington grew decisively, more than doubling in size, from 13,596 in 1870 to 27,868 in 1940. But this would hardly be even called a city in most states. Burlington had first made it in the, to the top five population centers in the state in 1820, and it's been there ever since. It started with the enormous geographical advantage of its location on a good natural harbor on Lake Champlain, surrounded by the breadbasket of the Champlain Valley. Its strategic and spectacular setting had already secured it the state's university, the medical college, the steamship company, the customs house, the courts, the retail center, and small factories by the time of the Civil War. States Hotel on Larrabee's Point in Shoreham. Um, and uh, summer houses were starting to appear on Thompson's Point and in the Champlain Islands. And summer camps were even starting. By the 20th century, there were summer camps at certain points on the lake. Things were looking better for this, you know, these more commercial parts of the state's economy. So economic change completely transformed the lake in the 20th century. Tourism came in. Burlington was cleaned up. State and city parks were established. The Church Street Marketplace was developed 
and the Burlington Boathouse made the waterfront fun for the masses, even if they didn't own their own yachts. I'm sure all of you did, but some of us didn't. But uh, many miles of shoreline are still unspoiled. This is one thing that always amazes me, is if you're out on a boat in a lake, if you take one of the boats from Larrabee's Point, for instance, that you can still take today, you can go for miles and miles, and it's still farm coming right up to the land. I mean, most lakes like this in such a beautiful spot, you know, would have had a ring road all the way around and been completely solid cottages, you know, um, a century ago at least. But um, there's still, especially when you get a little further south on the lake, there are still miles and miles of, of lakeshore where it's just, you know, it's just green. Um, and uh, and uh, the Echo Museum in Burlington tells the, some of the lake's story, and the bike path now follows the shoreline. All of our, you know, and as our aesthetic appreciation has increased, we have become more motivated to try to keep the precious waters of Lake Champlain clean. I mean, we still have issues with farm runoff, though, you know, they have certainly been working hard to make that better. There were problems up in the northern end of the lake with, um, you know, it gets clogged in, in the summer um, because of the runoff. And, you know, there are, you know, a lot of places I wouldn't want to drink out of the lake, would you? I don't think I would do that still. But it's gotten better than those days I've heard about from some old timers who told me about when they used to have their camp on the lake and you heard the water inspector was coming Somebody would tell you, you know, your dad would say, you know, put the towel and the pipe that went right from your septic, you know, right into the lake so that they wouldn't catch that you'd never put in a septic system. You just had a pipe running from your toilet into the water and they'd go stuff a, stuff a towel in there. So, you know, we've come a long way, uh, a long way from that era. But, uh, but, you know, there's still always a long way to go in, in trying to make make uh, the waters of the lake as clean as they were when Samuel de Champlain came in. So in the half billion, past half a billion years, Lake Champlain and its valley have gone from being a tropical oasis to a saltwater arm of the Atlantic to a paleo-Indian hunting ground to an Abenaki homeland to a major world war battlefield, to an industrial transportation hub, to a busy center of commerce, and finally to a beloved magnet for recreation and quiet contemplation. And it all started with a big bang. Thank you. <laughs>